Hello everyone. Okay, this is a short lesson on the consumer price index and uh, this one isn't really the the uh, math one or the one that's so much in Excel. I'll do that one later. This is just the conceptual ideas and problems behind the consumer price index. So first, well what is that thing? Well, it's an attempt to measure the average inflation rate as seen by consumers. So you might know that there's another index called the producer price index which is very similar but it tracks uh, producer prices which are slightly different and then there's a third one called the GDP deflator which is actually calculated a bit differently than the consumer price index and the producer price index but it's an attempt to measure the inflation rate across the whole economy including things that the government might buy okay so how do we get to this consumer price index well first it comes from a fixed basket of goods. They don't try to keep track of every good that's in the economy. They keep track of a certain number. Your book is a number kind of like 200, but I think the number is closer to 400. Uh, you can see, if you look, I have it here. This is the uh, Consumer Price Index Detail Report. Can you see this thing? And uh, this is the table of contents. Let me just show you. Uh, a table. You can find this if you just do a Google search on uh, the Consumer Price Index. It'll come up in the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics website. So this is table one. If you look at this, you can see there are this many food items. You can sort of count them up and they're not very many, which is what I think your book has probably done. But if you scan down to table three, which is a more detailed look at what's going on, now look at this. Can you see these things? So these on this page is just food items all the way from the top to the bottom. It's only food. All right, here let me make it a little bigger for you. Yeah, can you see that better? So this is just one page of the things that they keep track of. They're really quite interesting. There's frankfurters, luncheon meat. Can you imagine? And then here's a whole nother page, still food, right? Fresh uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, there's bananas. Hey, I like those. So that's the second page of all food things. And here's a third page. Okay, so now we're getting off of food. Oh my gosh, there's alcoholic beverages. Uh, here's housing, shelter, uh, fuel, and so forth. And then uh, here's apparel, things that we wear, uh, transportation costs. And I think that's it. Nope, there's another page right here. Here's medical care. So this is page five of table three. And now I think we might have them all. Nope. <laughs> Here's more. That's page six. Yeah, so six pages. So if you wanted to, you could try to add them all up. I think the number is more like 400. I, I, this, it's a pretty large number. But again, it's not everything. If you think about it, there's thousands and thousands of things made in the economy. Now let me see if I can get that off the screen. Yeah, so it's a fixed basket of goods, of roughly about 400 items, I think, that they track every month. Now, there's also fixed weight. So, for example, if the price of chewing gum went up and the price of gasoline went down, they wouldn't carry the same weight in the index. The uh, items in the basket are weighted based on how much money an average consumer spends on each one each month. So it's a fixed basket of uh, weighted items. And... Um, the basket gets kind of redesigned about every 10 years and they do this through a thing called the Consumer Expenditure Survey. And over the years I've only had I think one student who's actually ever seen a Consumer Expenditure Survey, but it's a survey that goes out and uh, volunteer consumers keep track of everything that they buy for several months and these things get turned into the Bureau of Labor Statistics and they generate a composite consumer. And a, average consumer and they from that survey they can figure out how much money this average consumer spends on each thing so again it gets redesigned about every 10 years because you can imagine new goods emerge all the time and old goods sort of fall away there it is the consumer expenditure survey goes out about every 10 years now over here on this side I've listed a few things that are kind of problems with the index that you might want to be aware of the first one is, well, how do you adjust for merging new products and loss of old products? And uh, there is no good way to do it. About all that the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics does is it redesigns the basket about every 10 years, and they're kind of hoping that that captures new goods that come in and old goods that fall away. 
The next problem is uh, harder, and that is, well, what to do, what to do about uh, quality changes in the product? For example, the thing might uh, once was made with high quality, now it's made with poor quality, or maybe it's the other way around. Or in the in the case of food items, a can of soup might have been like you know eight ounces of soup last month and selling for a dollar, and now it's like nine and a half ounces and still sells for a dollar. That would be a little bit of inflation. Or maybe the can got a little bit bigger. Maybe it went from 10 ounces to 12 ounces, for example, and the price went up a little bit. That's not necessarily inflation. So then, uh, what should we do when a particular price changes dramatically? So for example, imagine that chicken got really, really expensive, which happens on occasion. The average consumer would buy less chicken and would substitute other things, but our composite consumer that comes from the consumer expenditure survey buys exactly the same amount of chicken every month, and so uh, the composite consumer would witness a lot more inflation than the average consumer would who would avoid the higher prices of whatever they are. So let me get my image out of here. I think it's going to kind of crowd things. Uh, let's see. What about discount prices, especially like in college tuition or at, or at the hospital? You know, there is the list price, and then there's the price you actually pay. So which price should go into the consumer expenditure survey? When they put the index in there for college tuition, should they put the list price of college tuition, say at Charleston Southern University in there, or they should, should they put in there the discounted price that uh, many students receive? And the same at the hospital. You know, is it the list price or is it the price that your insurance company actually paid? So I have one more slide here, which is really techniques for adjusting the index for quality changes, and I want you to look at some of these. So we have, uh, this one actually is kind of easy. When the size of the product changes, we can just recalculate the price per constant unit. So for example, if a bag of potato chips was 10 ounces and it cost $2.99, and then you go to the grocery store the next month and you see that the bag of potato chips is now uh, $3.50, but it's 11 ounces, you have to figure out how much of that price increase came because the bag is a little bit bigger and how much came from inflation. Uh, excuse me. All right, sorry about that. So um, basically, this one's kind of easy. When the size of the product gets bigger or smaller, we can recalculate its price based on some constant unit. You know, it's price per ounce or it's price per pound or uh, whatever, price per yard maybe if it's uh, carpet. All right, but then some of these uh, quality changes are more complicated. So for example, what if the thing changes in many ways? Uh, the one I use in my face-to-face -face class is what about a refrigerator? Imagine that uh, last year there was a refrigerator that sold for $600 and it was maybe 20, uh, let's say it was uh, 20 cubic feet. And now uh, this year it's uh, 22 cubic feet, but the actual refrigerated space is smaller and the freezer space is much larger. Well, I hope you can see that some consumers would see that as an improvement in the refrigerator. That is, those consumers who really like the freezer and they want to fill up the freezer with ice cream or frozen food or something. But other consumers who are more interested in the refrigerated space would see it as a reduction in the quality because the refrigerated space is actually smaller. The, re the freezer is bigger, but that's not something they're interested in. And you could imagine other subtle changes in quality that would be even harder, like what if last year's model came in three colors, but this year's model comes in five? Or last year's model had free delivery, but this year's model does not? Or last year's model had a three-year warranty, and this year's model has a two-year or four-year warranty? So can you see that there are many, many different kinds of quality changes that can occur that we can't easily control with a simple uh, calculation? So for these kinds of quality changes, there are several techniques that the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses. The first, and I guess the simplest to understand, would be a panel of experts. They really do gather up like maybe engineers and marketing people and maybe consumer advocates or maybe even actual consumers. And uh, they put, put them in a conference room with a coffee pot and a, and a dozen donuts. And they make them sit in there until they come to some agreement about what's happened to the quality of some product. In other words, they will give a report that says, we think this new model is 5% 
improved quality or 20% less quality or whatever. So panel of experts is the first technique they use. Another one is called linking and I'm going to generate a, a separate lesson for that because it's a little bit complicated and we'll do it in Excel. The linking technique. A third method is the hedonic method. This is the most complicated at all, of all and it requires a regression equation. And most of you haven't had uh, statistics yet so this would be hard for you. But the basic idea is that in the hedonic technique they they collect all kinds of data that is quantifiable data that describes the quality of this product and then they run a regression equation and the computer spits out an equation that predicts the price of the product based on all the different changes that are going on in quality and then what they do is whatever's left over after that prediction because it won't be perfect there'll be some error so whatever's left over is assumed to be uh, inflation. So uh, it's kind of hard if you haven't had statistics yet, but basically the hedonic technique is a is a kind of a, a statistical technique to try to predict what's happening to the prices based on what we can observe is happening to quality and anything that's left over after that prediction is assumed to be inflation. That's enough for you to understand about it for just a sophomore level class. And this is my all-time favorite, and that is when it's really, really hard to figure out what's going on, they just assume there's no quality change. And uh, it sounds uh, really hysterical, but actually uh, that's a technique that they use uh, oftentimes in uh, services. So if you think about medical services or legal services, it's really, really difficult to measure quality changes in those things. And so generally speaking, uh, they don't. All right, I think that's uh, all of them and uh, here I am here I am back so um, you'll see a couple more lessons uh, more detail about the particular things and especially the uh, the linking technique alright hope you found this helpful